Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining the Startup Society Foundation podcast. Today, we are joined by Sky Blue, the Executive Director of the Foundation for Intentional Community. Sky, how are you doing today? I'm doing quite well. Thank you. How are you? Very fantastic. It's uh, summer here in Argentina. It's a little bit uh, brighter and sunnier than I assume in the United States. Well, I'm in uh, Northern California where it's sunny all the time. Uh, so. Fair point. Fair point. <laughs> Well, awesome. Well, I'm glad that you had a chance to, to sit down and chat. Uh, well, first, for our viewers who are not familiar, um, tell us a little bit about the foundation. What is its mission? Well, so the Foundation for Intentional Community is all about helping people to connect to and learn from intentional communities. Um, so our, our, the, the goals, uh, that, that, uh, encompass our mission, um, are that we want to increase the number of people who are living in intentional communities. We want, to, we want to increase the number of forming and established intentional communities that are out there. Uh, we want to increase the exchange amongst intentional communities and people and increase the sharing of community building skills to uh, the wider public. Um, we work, you know, directly with uh, intentional communities providing, you know, different kinds of resources and then uh, also through the website, uh, you know, provide a platform for people to connect to intentional communities, which we're looking at uh, evolving quite substantially over this uh, coming year. Um, and then there's just also an, a, a huge amount of content on intentional communities on our website that's just freely accessible for the public. Um, and that we know from our web traffic that a lot of people do come, they, they browse things, they look around. And, you know, what, what we, what we know is that, you know, there's all the communities out there. There's all the people who, who have lived in them, will live in them, do live in them. And then there's a lot of other people out there who are just getting inspiration from them and learning from them. And, you know, one of the things that we like to say is that one of the things that the world of intentional communities does is we export hope. You know, we, we give people a sense that, that there are actually other options available to them, regardless of whether they ever actually live in an intentional community themselves. There's, again, still lots to be learned and that can be applied in whatever community building sort of setting or endeavor anyone might be engaged in. So in that world of community building, there's a whole variety of, of different flavors out there. There's eco-villages, mm. there's, there's communities of faith, communes. What is a what is a common definition or or theme that ties together all intentional communities within your network? So there's you know there's a number of different um, different definitions that we've worked with over the years uh, of, of, of what is an intentional community, what constitutes an intentional community, um, and a couple of those that we've worked with uh, you know and more recently are. Sometimes we define an intentional community as a group of people who live together or who share common facilities and who regularly associate on the basis of explicit common values. Another more recent definition that we've we've played around with is that an intentional community is the social and economic relationships of a group of people who share space, resources, and values. Um, another body of work that I did with a, with a friend and colleague uh, was we we tr we started looking at criteria instead of definitions. And so we came up with the five R's, which are residence, rationale, responsibilities, resources, and respect. That basically an intentional community are groups of people who share these things. They either live together in the same house or in on different in different houses on the same piece of property. There's some collectively understood intention or purpose of the community. There's a governance or organizational structure at play with decision-making processes and membership agreements. There's some amount of economic or material exchange, mutual support. And then there's the, the, the respect part is that this is about autonomous individuals in voluntary association without coercion or violence to themselves or, or each other. Um, you know, and which, you know, translates a lot into nonviolent decision-making and um, conflict resolution. So these are the elements that a lot of our viewers are very interested in. So the Startup Science Foundation, um, if you read a little bit about it, is about uh, experimental communities and governance. So different ways of, of governing and whatnot. How how crucial is the concept of, of, of governance and, and different rule sets to the concept of intentional communities? And what type of flavors and experiments that happen as a consequence of them? Um, I would say it's, it's core. I mean, you know, like it's, you know, with the, with our, our criteria, the, the responsibilities part is, you know, what I would say encompasses that. And, and I think, um, you know, people coming together collectively to 
make decisions about their shared lives, their shared resources, um, you know, with some sense of shared purpose and what it is that they're working towards together. And then how is it that they then make decisions together and manage uh, getting done whatever it is that they want to get done together? Um, so, you know, this idea of governance about, you know, of, of, of people uh, being able to have a level of sort of collective self-determination uh, in that sense, where we together get to decide, you know, what the what the circumstances and conditions of our daily lives look like um, is is key. Um, and I think, you know, this is something that that, again, it's it, the one of the dangers. And I think some part of the sort of the legacy of intentional communities is, is uh, there's a certain, you know, you go back to the 60s and 70s, there's a certain amount of sort of escapism and isolationism that was that was happening then, which had its reasons, and we could we could get into a, a whole discussion of that. But but I think the key part there is that you know, whereas the conception was like, oh, we're trying to get away from society, that's just not really the case anymore. The you know, intentional communities in this day and age over the last 20, 25 years has been a growing trend, and increasingly they're they're more about saying, hey, we're not separate from society, we're part of society, and that we are we are we are laboratories, we're training grounds, we're microcosms of larger society and what we're doing together to try to figure out how to work out uh, decision making amongst around shared resources and, and doing it in a way that, that without uh, in, in engaging in violent conflict. I mean, this is kind of the what humanity as a whole needs to figure out, right? Like we're humanity as a whole has this planet with finite resources and we've got to figure out how to live together and share these great resources equitably without killing each other in the process. And so, so intentional communities and the governance aspect is, is really core to what they're doing and, and to them as sort of models and responses to what's going on in the world. So in, in terms of, of, of governance in relation to, to other intentional communities, but also to commu host communities, like the larger governance, uh, governments or communities that it's nested in, how do, how do intentional communities currently interact with them and how do they intend in the future? Uh, for instance, a lot of, uh, special economic zones, which are areas with different rule sets, secure partnerships from governance that allow them to have slightly different rules in order to govern themselves a little bit more autonomously in some cases. Do you foresee a movement within intentional communities to work with local governments to free up zoning regulations or energy restrictions so that they can more freely experiment with their ways of living? Yeah, there's definitely, you know, some key points of public policy that, uh, that intentional communities do already tend to run into. And some of the most common, of course, are things like, uh, building codes, uh, zoning regulations, these sorts of things. Um, uh, and there's also, uh, uh, a, a set of laws that exist in many, many cities called, uh, often referred to as cohabitation laws that sort of restrict the number of unrelated adults that can live in a, in a, a dwelling together or live on a, on a, a piece of property. Um, you know, and, and I know there, you know, I've heard of different things out there around groups that have tried to work with cities to set up, you know, different kinds of ordinances uh, to be able to make these sorts of things more possible. So like, for example, I know a good one is um, uh, Boulder, Colorado, a number of years ago passed uh, an ordinance legalizing housing cooperatives. And so now, through the city, there's about, I think, a dozen or so legal housing cooperatives that have a sort of, you know, a, a set of, of rules that can allow them to get around some of the restrictions that that sort of, you know, more informal collecting, collective living could uh, run afoul of. Um, so I think, you know, I think this effort is definitely key. And, and again, I think the, you know, I, I think the, the, the key, the, po the point here is, you know, it's, it's about the model ability. And, and so, so, you know, I, I think... We in the foundation are not necessarily saying like, oh, we're going to restructure all of human society to be a whole bunch of different intentional communities. I mean, for one, we have cities, you know, they exist, you know, we've got to do something with them. We're not going to just overnight deconstruct them and then reconstruct, you know, some some new utopia. So so again, what does it look like to apply a lot of the, the things that that these smaller experiments uh, are doing on on larger levels? And like you're saying, how do they interact with? Uh, local governments to be able to make those experiments more possible. And yeah, that, that sort of thing is definitely happening. Um, you know, but as, but it's also looking at like, well, how do you, how do you, how would you take a neighborhood, 
um, and and sort of convert it. And there are definitely intentional communities out there that are what are referred to as retrofits. You know, people in a, a neighborhood buying up pieces of of uh, different houses that are contiguous together, and then coming up with creative legal structures uh, for how to manage it in in ways that you know sort of conform to to the rules that they have to conform to. Um, but I, I think you know in general, I, I I also see a trend towards people from intentional communities doing things like running for city council or, you know, being, uh, you know, running for county supervisors or, you know, these sorts of things, like getting engaged on the local level. And I, I think that's really where we have the most leverage, uh, both to actually make a change in the world and also to apply uh, the kinds of things that intentional communities are working on. So it, obviously it's very important to govern it with the host communities, but as sort of a, a for lack of a better word, a central organization of these uh, different intentional communities, there's governance between the different communities as well. What are what are some sort of rules of thumb, at least, for for mitigating disputes among different intentional communities, or what are lines in the sand for different communities? Like, if a community implements a certain policies or starts enacting certain behaviors, are they are they disassociated from the organization? What type of processes are there for governing the network that you have? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And and this is definitely something we run into uh, sometimes because I mean the the you know one answer to your question is that is that that level of governance does not currently exist. However, the foundation does sort of exist as the closest thing to to that. And you know because of the directory, uh, you know, and the the listings that we have there, and and you know that being a place where often people find communities and go to them, then if uh, something bad happens, uh, we are often the people that they go to. Um, and uh, you know, there's there's only so much we can actually do because we are a small grassroots nonprofit. We don't have the capacity to you know send people to every community where there's some kind of a, a dispute and sort of evaluate and figure out what's going on. You know, it's a mostly just over email or occasionally over phone and sort of figuring out what happened. And, and and again, just to be clear, this is more about people within communities as opposed to between communities. That doesn't happen a whole lot. There's not, we don't see a whole lot of, of conflict between communities. If that happens, it's more because there is a, a smaller uh, more formal network of, of some group of communities, maybe local to, to a particular area or maybe more sort of regional in scope. Um, you know, and anything that's going to happen there, that's more going to be where, where it's dealt with. Um, however, again, you know, one person did reach out to me a number of, a couple of years ago and said, Oh, we've got a, a group of houses in this city. And there was an instance of, of sexual assault in one of the houses and the person was was you know was was kicked out but then eventually there was a whole process that was done and there was a reconciliation process that happened with the the person who committed the assault with people who were the victims of it and the the house where the thing had happened they'd actually gotten to a point of feeling okay about the person still coming around but people in the other houses had not been as involved with that and they still didn't feel okay with it. And so you did start to, you had this sort of conflict brewing between this, this, um, network of, of houses in, in an area. And so I did a little bit of, you know, just kind of troubleshooting with this person, talking them through, okay, well, how might you go about, about dealing with this? Um, but for the, for the foundation, we, you know, we, um, we do have some restrictions on, on who can list in the directory. And basically it, what it boils down to is if you, uh, if you advocate violence, you are you can't uh, uh, be in the directory. If you um, if you engage in basically manipulation or coercion, if you restrict members' access to leave or contact people outside of the community, um, then you can't uh, be be involved. And so basically, you know, you, the definition of intentional community could well extend to militias and cults. However, we're saying, regardless of that, those groups are not welcome in this in this network. Um, and then there's also an expectation that groups represent themselves accurately in the directory. And that's one of the things that comes up sometimes, too, is somebody will contact us and say, hey, this group said this, but I got there and it's completely different. And this person is problematic in these ways. And then again, we, we, we do what we can to try and sort out the truth of that. 
But at the end of the day, our only power in the situation is to remove them from the directory. So, so there is a certain, you know, missing in the movement at this point of a larger kind of coordinated governance or accountability structure. Um, and we're very aware of it. Again, you know, things happen sometimes. And one, in one case, there was a big internal conflict in communities, and clearly problematic behavior happening on the part of, of one of the core people. Uh, lawsuit, lawsuits started to happen. Um, you know, we were asked to, 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 uh, kind of look at the situation. We asked to, started asking questions to various people. And then we started getting threatened with legal action. And again, we're a small gra- grassroots nonprofit. We don't have a lawyer on retainer. We can't really deal with a lawsuit. So it was just, a, it was a pretty, it's a terrible situation to feel sort of hamstrung in that way of feeling like, wow, we're the only people here who could maybe even really do something to help provide that, that level of, of sort of action or accountability or support. And, but we're, but we, we, it's too, dangerous for us as an organization or whatever. So, so I feel like this is a place where, you know, us as an organization, part of what we're doing is we're trying to build the movement. We're trying to foster the movement so that more things like coordinated action amongst intentional communities or oversight and accountability between intentional communities become more possible. No, that's definitely a very core part. And maybe something that the Startup Society Foundation would be willing to help in some ways. We've developed some open source tools for legal disputes. But the broader thing that I've, I've gotten from all this is, is something that's very clear. Anyone who's trying to do one of these experiments is forming a community is really hard. It's really complicated. Um, and it's really important to know what works and what doesn't work. And in your experience, what are some common obstacles or mistakes that intentional communities can make? Well, I think, um, you know, when, it, when, it, what I would, what I would boil the three biggest issues uh, down to would be, uh, purpose, relationships, and money. Uh, so basically, if a group is not clear about what its purpose is, uh, that can have, you know, a lot of different consequences. And that purpose doesn't necessarily have to be something big and lofty. Uh, but it, it should be clear and it should be something that everyone in the group, uh, has some, you know, reasonable level of shared understanding of what that is, what, you know, whether it's defined in a vision and mission statement or, you know, whatever it is, you know, that the, whatever the, the words being used, you know, that sort of thing that people are more or less on the same page. And that when, when disagreements come up, you know, to look to, Oh, are we on the same page about this? So is, is part of the conflict or disagreement about whatever related to some difference in interpretation about what our values are, what our mission is, or, you know, anything like that. So it's that it again, it's sort of that quality of, of, of being intentional of bringing intention collectively to what it is that you're doing. Um, and that it, which just that in itself, you know, sort of creates a, a level of sort of conscious choice that again, people collectively are bringing in, which is very, which is you know, core to, to what this is all about. Um, and then that definitely relates in part to the relationship side of things. In that, you know, you want to be bringing people into your group who are in alignment with your purpose. And so, again, there's there's sort of a, you know, a path there. And, you know, most groups have some kind of a membership process where, to some extent, a new person is sort of vetted. And part of that should be, are they in alignment with the purpose? But then the relationships, obviously, it's much it's much bigger than that. You know, uh, uh, we were, we're social animals. We, we want to be together, and yet we drive each other crazy at the same time. We're not equipped, uh, given our, our upbringing for the most part to actually live collectively and in actually democratic kind of, kind of ways. Um, so there's an immense amount of learning and unlearning that has to happen in being able to just get along with people. I, I had a, uh, somebody from, uh, from a, a community I, I interviewed earlier this year who, who said that, that one of the things, one of the biggest things that, that, uh, capitalism does is it takes away our ability to get along. And I, and I think what he was pointing to was the sort of, you know, hyper individualism, uh, fueled by sort of a, a dominance of, of kind of commercial consumer, uh, orientation that just it separates people. And we know right now that, you know, there's starting to be these studies that are coming out that are showing that as much as like 40% of the U.S. population are suffering from loneliness right now, that, you know, former attorney, uh, 
or former Surgeon Generals are coming out and saying, like, this is an epidemic and this has real health consequences and we should be looking at this. And again, I think intentional community is very much about, uh, you know, helping to satisfy that sense of belonging that people need to be, you know, to feel human and feel whole as people. And also to, again, kind of relearn the skills for how to actually do that uh, in a way where you're not just driving each other crazy all the time. And then the last aspect is, you know, like I said, it's money and, you know, and there's just a reality, you know, whether, whether you're how do, regardless of how you feel about money, capitalism, all of that, that, that's the game, you know, and, and we have to be able to play that game and we have to be very honest and transparent about how we deal with money, especially collectively because of how much baggage we have and how challenging it is to exist in the, the financial system as we, as we have it today. So, Lots of groups, you know, because of the, the, the particular value set or culture that they might be coming from, often one, you know, have a, an aversion to dealing with money, and then it bites them, you know, because they they haven't actually just dealt with the realities of the, the world that we live in in that regard. Would you say that capitalism and intentional communities are inherently antagonistic? Is there a possibility of a let's say a capitalist intentional community? What's the line between intention and sustainability? Well, you know, I mean, I think, I think there's a, again, there's a sort of a deep conversation that could be had here about what, what is fundamental to capitalism? What is the nature of it? I think, you know, I think capitalism as it exists, you know, I, I won't necessarily get into a, an argument about that capitalism in any form is unsustainable, but at least I think it, I think it's very clear that capitalism in its current form is, is unsustainable. Um, so I would, I, I, there, what's interesting though is that there certainly are some models of intentional community. You see this more in the co-living, uh, world where you do actually have for-profit companies that are essentially curating the membership of households, uh, and the people who come in, you know, develop some level of community, but they're basically still, you know, they're, they're paying landlords essentially. Um, and, and then again, there, there is a, a for-profit aspect. To it, and I, you know, and I think it's fascinating, you know, and I, and I, and again, I mean, for as from the Foundation for Intentional Communities perspective, like, I mean, it's all welcome, you know, we're all all these different models, they're all different experiments again, and how do people come together, share resources, have more of a sense of belonging, feel like what they're doing matters, you know, uh, and uh, and 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 so we we want to embrace all of that, and you know, and again, but then you know, there's also sort of the larger vision, like where are we where are we trying to go. Here, you know, and 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 for us as as an organization, I think you know we do look at 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 uh, you know sort of some core values around uh, cooperation, sustainability, social justice, and, and and saying, well, regardless of our you know the argument about capitalism and and whatever financial system you want to use, I mean, there's some basic stuff here around you know everyone needs to be able to get their basic needs met, you know, and I mean, and this is sort of the basics of the you know the root the root of the word economy is uh is home is the greek word for home you know where where we get it back to how do we make sure that everyone is is able to access the resources and participate in the decision making in order to get their basic needs met and that that is not happening at the expense of other people and is all happening within you know some basic sustainability guidelines for the resources of the planet you know so then so then what does that look like you know, I mean, so we can, we, we, I, I think there's another part of the, the opportunity, intentional communities is just to be like, like, okay, let's just start from a very different set of ground rules and a very different set of organizational or design principles, a different set of values. What, what, what's possible at that, at that point? And so, you know, whether you're only sort of slightly diverging from, from the, from the, the norms of, you know, mainstream culture or capitalism or anything like that, or whether you're going in a more extreme, direction you're still questioning fundamental assumptions and i think that questioning is is one of the most important parts of what intentional communities are doing and what's needed in the world today absolutely and it, it, it's it's a lofty goal um and but like you said a lot of times these communities they don't understand best practices or they don't understand the right. necessary tools to make everything happen what what type of services products tools counseling do you provide to people in your network to make sure that more of these things thrive and experiment. 
Well, there's, uh, like I said, you know, we have, so our website is ic.org, um, Foundation for Intentional Community. We've been around for, uh, 30, a little over 30 years now. And, you know, we were early enough adopters of the internet that we managed to get a two letter domain name, um, which, you know, that those didn't last very long when, when the internet got started. Um, and, and on ic.org, uh, there's, you know, we have uh, an immense amount of content, you know, you can go, going back to our blog, going through, so we've been publishing, we've published Communities Magazine for the last 30 years, um, or 40 years, or, no, yeah, I guess 30 years. Um, at any rate, the, you know, all of that content, compilations of articles from the magazine that we've put together over the years are on there. You know, last year we did a whole Wisdom of Communities series, which is on uh, starting community, joining community, communication and community, and sustainability and community. Um, and then lots of other books, lots of free downloads and resources. So lots of stuff that's available uh, in that in that regard. And then, you know, and then people contact us all the time with different questions about, you know, about, again, so, you know, I mentioned earlier, conflicts that they're having and how to deal with that or more technical questions around legal structures or, you know, what if, you know, oh, we're interested in in having our community be a 501c3, but we're wondering if we can still run a business, you know, so there's all, all, all manner of different technical things. Uh, you know, h- how do we set up our, our labor system for the community? How many hours a week should people do? You know, these kinds of questions. And so a lot of, I'll, I'll spend a lot of time, uh, you know, just kind of emailing with people and kind of just bouncing ideas around, asking them questions. Cause you know, every group on some level, you know, they, they, you, you should be looking at what other groups are doing. Uh, but also at the end of the day, you know your group best. Um, so whatever is a best practice for one group is not necessarily going to be a best practice for, for your group. Um, that said, I mean, one of the, 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 the first pieces of advice that I often give people is, you know, use our advanced search function on, on our online directory and look for groups that are similar to you or similar to what it is that you want to do and then reach out to them and say, Hey, how did you do X, Y, and Z? And sometimes, you know, from what somebody is telling me, I could say, oh, you should really look at this group or you should really look at this group, you know, kind of direct them. Or, you know, this organization ha- is a little bit more specialized in, in the area that you're you're looking at. And so you might reach out to them. So we kind of do that, that sort of switchboard networking sort of sort of thing for a lot of groups as well. Um, we're, we're also looking at uh, we're, we're in the process of, of designing a, a massive uh, restructuring of the the website um, to include a much more active platform for communities and people to connect with each other and a whole knowledge base that will include a whole reorganization of all of the content, as well as creating a community document library. So this is something we get asked about a lot is, is, oh, do you have examples of particular kinds of, you know, bylaws or different sorts of things that are typical for communities? And, and we don't have a good library of that i mean i have a few things here and there that i can pull but but that's one of the things we're looking at putting pulling together in this this new knowledge base we're starting to develop uh as well as a discussion forum so so basically we're you know what we've been for a long time is as a is a more is a you know there's a base of resource that people can access and what we're trying to do with this new platform is really trying to create more more of a platform for engagement um and sharing of content more directly between people and communities Wow, it's it's awesome to hear that there's such concentrated, focused movement building coming out from the intentional community movement, and uh, and based off of that, it, it sounds like it has a rosy future. For the last question, uh, where do you see intentional communities in the next ten to twenty years? That's a really great question. Um, so I think you know I think it's uh, I think the the impact is. Uh, increasingly being recognized, you know, the uptick in media exposure, uh, that we've seen over the last couple of years has, has been, been pretty amazing. And, it, and again, you know, and it definitely in part noticing the connection with this sort of increased recognition of, of loneliness. You know, there was a, the time actually did a, there was a, uh, posted a, a, a long article particularly about intentional communities as a sort of solution or response to, to loneliness. Crisis, um, and I think in general, you know, over the last you know little while, I think I think as you know the 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 late 2000s into the early 2000s, you know, between 
uh, increase, you know, actual examples of, of climate change happening, the, the Great Recession, these sorts of things. I think, you know, there was a there was a bigger there was a big kind of collective oh shit moment that, you know, society as a whole started having. And then, you know, and then I think, uh, you know, there, there started to then be a, a, a look for solutions. And so I think when we get, you know, the Atlantic and Time and CNN and these kinds of big media companies interested in looking at intentional communities, you know, they're not, they're not stupid. You know, they, they know what their audience is, is wanting because they're, you know, beholden to getting, you know, bid to their, to their advertisers. So they, they're going to, they're going to run what they know people are, are interested in. And so I'm like, okay, well, they clearly think that their audience is interested in this. And I believe it's because people are looking for solutions. And so there's, there's something to be offered here. Again, you know, what does it mean? It, what, what is the growth trend? You know, it's something we're, we're, we're looking at more and more. And obviously we want to increase the growth. It's also, you know, what's also true is that the barriers are higher than they used to be. You know, the, the land is more expensive. Uh, the economy is, is harder. You know, you, 40 years ago, you know, I mean, I lived at Twin Oaks community uh, in Virginia for, for a lot of years, and it's a 52 year old community right now. It started in 1967, and the folks that started it, you know, there's eight people who worked second jobs for a year or so to save up enough money to buy 150 acres of land. You can't do that now. You can't work a second job and, and, and save money. You're still barely making it. So there's, so there's some, there's some factors here and just, you know, the general, uh, you know, the, in some quarters people talk about, um, uh, you know, like Joanna Macy, I think it's talked about the, the, the great de-skilling, you know, so we're the intentional communities are desperately trying to relearn and teach, you know, a set of skills that mainstream society is still actively taking away from, from people. So, you know, again, those, those skills and like, how, how do you get along? How do you build houses? You know, how do you do basic maintenance? You know, these are things that are that unfortunately are, are, are increasingly elusive for people to learn. So again, the while the, the the interest and the drive is is clearly increasing, especially amongst both younger people and older people who are like, I'm getting old and I'm lonely and I feel disconnected and who's gonna care for me? You know, and young people who are like, How do I survive in this crazy world and this economy in it today you know the the interest is there the barriers are also higher so so you know uh, obviously you know our work is to try to help people overcome those those barriers and you know with these new developments we have uh coming in 2020 i'm, I'm certainly hopeful that um that all of that will be able to help people overcome those barriers more easily well sky this is uh this is incredibly exciting and thank you so much for joining us on the show uh, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, everyone, thank you again for joining the Startup Studies Foundation podcast and make sure to check out their website and see if an intentional community is right for you.